Hello, everyone, um, and welcome to uh, this presentation about uh, OPackage, um, Debian's little cousin. Um, this presentation um, is a recording, um, so feel free and, uh, to put your questions on the chat window. And at the end, I'm going to be available to uh, go ahead and answer those. OK, so a little bit about myself. Uh, this is how I look like. So if in um, a better world where we can see each other at conferences again, you see me in the hallway, uh, please uh, say hi. Uh, come say hi, and um, we can talk about uh, OPackage or about uh, you know these other projects that I've been involved with. Um, so I work for NI. Um, the company that uh, it used to be known as National Instruments just went through a rebranding. Um, and my involvement with open source goes back about 10 years. Um, we create a, we have a, a platform of embedded controllers and we need to modernize that platform. And so around 2010, we decided to use a Linux uh, with the preempt RT patch. And a group was created to build a distribution which uh, we called it the NI Linux real-time distribution. That distribution was based on uh, Open Embedded, uh, Yocto, um, which got me involved with those projects. Um, our software stack is pretty complicated. It has a dependency um, tree that is very wide and deep. So quickly we started uh, hitting the corner cases and limitations of OPackage, the package manager that is used um, by Open Embedded. Um, so when um, there was an opportunity to step up, since the previous maintainer uh, was no longer able to, to, to maintain OPackage, I stepped up and became the maintainer. Uh, and I've been the maintainer ever since, since 2015. Um, below, there are some other projects uh, that I I'm involved in uh, Jupyter Hub and uh, Solstack. So today, I'm first going to give you guys a historical context on the project. Then I'm going to dive into the architecture. Then the most interesting part of the architecture is the dependency management solvers. So I'm going to be talking about uh, the, both the internal solver as well as, uh, as, well as libsolve. Then I'm gonna finish up with uh, some ideas of where I see the future work on a package. And there's gonna be some time to answer whatever questions you guys may have. Uh, please put those on the chat. So let's start with historical context. Um, a package is based on an uh, iPackage iPackage was created in 2001 by Carl Worth, uh, which is a long time contributor uh, of open source, um, maybe better known for uh, being the creator of a uh, libcairo to uh, the graph library for Linux. Um, IPKG, its name comes from uh, its CBT package manager, and it started just as a shell script. But as it started to become uh, popular, it was rewritten in C. Um, it was originally created for the Linksys uh, NSLRU2, which is the appliance that you see on the right. Um, it's basically this appliance that you can connect to uh, Ethernet and you plug in USB sticks, and then you, got, you have network storage. And this platform was running an embedded Linux distribution. Um, however, the project um, lost momentum, and the last known commit was a uh, in mid-2007. Uh, so fast forward to 2008, um, uh, there was a, a Linux distribution called OpenMoco, um, which was targeted for smartphones when smartphones started to, to, to become a thing. Um, OpenMoco started using uh, IPKG as its package manager, but since IPKG was no longer maintained, uh, patches starting to pile up, and they decided to fork. Um, since there was a trademark on IPKG, they decided to call it OPackage, the O from uh, OpenMoco. Um, 
Then, uh, around the same time, uh, Marcin decided to uh, also adopt a package for Open Embedded. Uh, Open Embedded at the time was using IPKG as well. Um, o package, it's actually um, two projects. It's O package and then O package utils, which is a repo with helper scripts. Um, for example, there's Open Make uh, packages, which creates an index, uh, open, uh, make index. Um, and there's op op package build, which is another script that helps you uh, build packages. And, and these uh, scripts are used by OE too. So um, OpenMoco lost momentum too, because Android became the de facto uh, standard for um, UIs on, on mobile. Uh, then uh, most of the um, efforts behind the development of a package moved to OE. And uh, below is a list of, of previous maintainers, Thomas Muth, Wood, Tick Chen, Graham Gower, and before me, uh, Paul Barker. So O package now. Um, right now it's under the Yocto project, project umbrella. They provide Git hosting uh, as well as um, the Boxilla ticketing system. Um, the mailing list is on Google Groups and uh, I'm maintaining it and I'm releasing it twice a year. So June and December. So there's a, an upcoming release um, within the next few days. Um, and I will say that at this point, all packages is premature. Um, there was work that I'm gonna be covering later on the presentation um, to create a plugin solver um, backend, which vastly improved the project. Um, and also most of the features that you will expect from a package manager, they're done. So if you're considering a package manager for, for embedded, I um, highly encourage you to uh, take a look at O package. Okay, so now I'm gonna be covering um, some of the architecture. I copy this quote from the uh, original IPKG uh, FAQ. And it's basically saying that um, o package should try to do things like Debian does unless there is a very strong reason not to. Um, and I will say this is kind of like the golden rule of uh, o package development. Um, it is all over the source code and um, at the very least that's something that I follow uh, very closely. So if there is a bug report, I try to see how Debian handles it and I try to model a uh, package after that. You may also ask, um, there's already very good package managers. Why, why do you need another one? Why not just use Debian, a uh, dpackage? Um, there's a few reasons. Some of them are uh, historical. To me, the biggest one, the one that resonates uh, more with me is, is size. Uh, so here I have benchmarks of an OE build of the um, smallest image, which is called core image minimal, uh, with the different package managers. Um, if you use RPM, the package manager is gonna be DNF, which is based on Python, and that's going to set you back 245 megabytes. Um, if you use the package, the package has dependencies on Perl, and that's gonna cost you 37 megabytes. And then a package, since it's written in C, and only has one hard dependency, which is libre ar archive, it's just gonna be 4.6 megabytes. So big difference. The internal structure of an IPK, the, the packages that a package uh, handles, is super similar to a Debian package. Um, you have an external uh, R file, and inside you have uh, your rootfs in a data.tar uh, compressed uh, archive. And then you have another archive uh, where you have your uh, control file as well as your maintainer scripts. So you have things like your pre-install, post-install, pre-remove, post-remove, which are scripts that run at specific times during installation, removals or upgrades uh, to give you hooks to um, register things with the system, uh, start services, uh, et cetera. Um, there's also an optional com files uh, file where you, if you have uh, paths there, those are considered com files. So if you are upgrading a package 
uh, an account file was changed, uh, a backup is uh, created. Um, there's another optional file called MD5 sums. So if you uh, have that file with paths and MD5 sums, you can run a package verify and that's going to make sure that the files that you have on your file system has the same MD5 sums uh, as you know the files on the package. Um, I have in bold the um, pieces that are required. Uh, the other ones are optional. Um, on the right hand side of the screen, um, I have an example control file. And on red, I have the fields that are um, required. The other ones are optional. So really you just need a package name, version, and architecture uh, to be able to, to have a package install a, a file. And that's different than, than Debian. Debian requires uh, more stuff. So differences from the package. Uh, there are a few, and I'm going to highlight uh, a couple. Um, the way architectures are being handled is, is quite different. Um, on a package, uh, you can define for specific targets which architectures the target is compatible with. So for example, and you define that in com files. Mm. Here, uh, I'm saying that uh, this example target is compatible with uh, architecture all, x86-64, x86, x86, core 264, and x64. And on the right, the column on the right, that's the priority. So if you have a package that um, it's um, available on, on multiple uh, repos, you will use the priority to uh, determine uh, which one uh, you should install. Um, following on the example, I'm defining three repos, one for the architecture all, one for core 264, and the other one for x86-64. So let's say that all of them have a busybox. If you do a package install busybox, you will install the one with the highest architecture, which will be the one on the repo for core 264. Um, and this is different than the package. On the package, targets have a fixed architecture, and then the package being installed has to match that architecture. Um, and there's some flexibility, like you you have the option to use wildcards, or there is the all uh, and any architecture, but, uh, but in general, uh, is is more rigid. The other difference is that um, all package tries to be uh, simpler. So what I'm showing here is the state diagrams uh, um, for a few operations. Here's the, the one for install. So when you install, there's a set of things that, that happen. You first run your pre-install script, uh, you unpack your files, and then you run a post-install script. Um, on the package, there's basically more um, fail saves. So um, if your pre-install Pre-inst uh, script failed, the package has a way to, to recover from that. So you, you can basically call uh, your post remove script with a specific um, a parameter called abort install. And uh, you can add a code in your post remove uh, with a case structure to recover from that. And then if you can recover, then uh, you end up uh, in an okay state instead of on a, a half a install state that will require some manual intervention to, to recover from. Here I'm showing the diagrams for remove. Um, as you can see, it's super similar. The difference being that um, um, the package has a way to recover from um, a pre-remove uh, script failure. The last diagram is for upgrade. And I'm really not gonna go through this diagram. It's super complex, as you can see. Uh, but my bigger point is that um, the package tries really hard to, to recover from problems that you can have uh, with scripts. Uh, o package takes a simpler appro approach saying, well, if a script failed, uh, you're in a bad state and you may need to uh, go ahead and follow some manual steps to recover. Okay, so here what I'm showing is um, the recipe for the latest version of O package. Um, and what I wanted to show here is that O package has only one hard dependency, and that's on libarchive. Um, it has this dependency because uh, via libarchive, uh, 
all the different type of compressions are supported and uh, doing that uh, with custom code uh, was hard. That was done in the past, but you know, was uh, was a limiting factor. Uh, so um, back in OPackage 0.3.0, um, uh, hard dependency on libarchive um, was added. There's a bunch of other things that you can select to um, to use. For example, if you want to use um, repo signing, you wanna you may want to enable GPG. Um, if you want to use curl instead of a uh, wget, then you may want to uh, enable curl. Um, the other one that is very relevant here is libsolve. Um, if you enable libsolve, then you will add a dependency of, of the external library libsolve, but then you will get a very powerful um, solver for dependency management. Um, and just to give an idea on, on, on space, I think libarchive adds about um, 600k. O package by itself is about um, 200k, and libsolve is about a, a 500k, a, and this is on an x64 architecture. So before we move to solvers, um, I want to talk about the O package ATS. This is something that Paul um, Barker did, um, and I think I think it's great. I like it a whole lot. It makes my life so much simpler. Um, so the way it works um, is that uh, it's Python based and you can define different uh, scenarios um, to check for. For example, here I'm saying there is package A, which depends on B, and then there's package B. Um, let's write that down to a package file, run a package update, and then install A. Make sure then that A is installed, if not error out, and make sure that B is installed, if not error out. And I'm mentioning all this because this is, this is terminology um, that I'm gonna use on the rest of the presentation uh, whenever we go through a few um, scenarios. Okay, so now I'm gonna be talking about um, solvers. So, um, there's been changes in OPackage uh, since version 0.3.1 uh, uh, that improved the solver uh, mechanism a, a whole lot. So before, um, in, in versions previous uh, um, to 0 0.3.2, um, I'm gonna walk you through how the dependency engine worked. Um, so what I'm showing here, it's um, a scenario where you have package A that depends on both package B and C. Uh, the green arrows mean uh, depends. And then package C conflicts with D. So the red arrow means um, conflicts. So if I say install D, then we go ahead and install D. And then if I say install A, uh, what a package used to do is that it will do a depth search, a uh, depth first search. So it will start on A and say, well, um, A depends on B. Then it's gonna say, hey, uh, does B has dependencies? No, B doesn't have dependencies. Let me go ahead and install it. Then it will go and say, hey, uh, does C have dependencies? And say, yeah, it depends on D, and uh, D is, it, it conflicts with D, and D is already installed. It will error out, but then your system will be polluted because B will be left installed. Um, so this was a major problem. It was basically, installing as it was solving. It was a, a one operation. So on version 0 0.3.2, um, I split the operations to solve first and then uh, modify the file system. So see, this is the exact same scenario. You have A depends on B and C, and then C conflicts with D. So you will first solve. So here, here I'm saying, uh, let's install D and then let's try to install A. Um, during the solving uh, portion of the operation, uh, we will determine that there's a conflict. So we'll say, I cannot uh, continue and your system will be uh, left uh, without modifications. This second scenario is just uh, showing you how a successful operation will look like. So. Uh, we have the same dependency graph, and then uh, we say, let's go ahead and install A. Um, 
the internal solver will walk to the uh, dependency tree and will determine that uh, this is solvable. So then it's gonna pass all the things that need to happen to the second part um, of the process, which will go ahead and install A, B, and C. So this was a, a, a great improvement uh, over what we have. Um, however, uh, the internal solver remain, um, remain to be a, a, a headache, honestly. Um, it was the main cause of bugs, um, and it had a lot of tentacles. So if you wanted to implement something new, you will modify a certain area of the code that then will be uh, affecting uh, other use cases. There, it, it was very tightly coupled, um, and uh, and it was hard to modify. It was a very complicated, uh, it, it is a very complicated code. Um, on the other hand, dependency management is a very well-researched topic. So with all of that, um, I managed to convince my boss to get an intern uh, that I could work with uh, to go ahead and add support for um, Libsolve, a dependency package dependency management library. Um, so I got a chance to work with Eric Yu, and um, we were able to add um, Libsolve support uh, to our package, which was a, a, a major milestone. So what is Libsolve? Um, Libsolve is, uh, it was created by M Michael Schroeder uh, from SUSE in June 2007 during a hack week. Um, and it's a library that um, solves uh, dependencies for packages. So what he did is that he grabbed a Minisat, which is an open source library that uh, implements a specific type of SAT solver. Uh, it's actually very small. It's like 600, 600 lines of code. Uh, and he re-implemented it, but added a uh, package manager specifics. So um, for example, um, when you are solving, you wanna uh, favor to leave packages that are installed uh, installed on the system. So he added those uh, heuristics uh, and enhanced uh, the core algorithm of, of Minisat to then have a library that is very well suited for a uh, package management uh, dependency uh, resolution. And uh, to me, my point of view was, this is a very hard uh, domain and there are domain experts. So let's delegate all that to them uh, and I can focus on, uh, on other areas of the project. So, um, Libsolve uh, was created by uh, OpenSUSE and is used on Zipper and on um, um, other package managers that are RPM based. So what about Debian? Um, Debian has also been uh, experimenting with um, SAT solvers. Uh, what they did is that they created this protocol called EDSP, External Dependency Solver Protocol. And then you can just app get installed uh, a solver and use the dash dash solver flag to tell the package to, I'm sorry, apt-get to use a different um, dependency solver. Um, so package could have used a, um, a similar mechanism or could have plugged into EDSP. Uh, but honestly, Libsolve is working so well. Uh, Michael, uh, the maintainer, is very responsive and uh, he either has guided me into uh, uh, into the Libsol code base to to fix my own uh, errors or uh, my, my own bugs, or he has fixed them for me. Uh, that right now I'm very very happy with Libsol. Uh, a nice project could be to enhance or package to also support an EDSP uh, backend. But right now, like Libsol works really well for us. Okay, so on the next couple of slides. I'm gonna keep covering uh, SAT solvers. So what are they? Uh, there are some software engines that try to solve the Boolean satisfiability problem. Um, so the Boolean satisfiability problem, uh, uh, what it's about is that uh, if you have an expression, like the one uh, at the bottom, uh, the symbol next to the A means not, uh, the problem says, okay, try to find 
values of a, b, and c that makes a, that expression true. Um, and this problem is NP-complete, so it's very hard to, to solve in a generic way. Uh, but SAT solvers try to use heuristics, uh, and they have been very, very successful. Uh, SAT solvers are not only used for dependency management, they're widely used for uh, EDA uh, or for routing on FPGAs uh, with millions of variables. Um, so following this example, uh, let's say that you have a not A or B and not A or C. If A equals true, the only way that that expression is gonna be true is if B and C uh, are true. And uh, that's the solution and it means that that expression is uh, satisfiable. Um, so once that I set A to true, uh, the first clause became false or B and the second clause become became false or C, the process of determining that B needs to be true and C needs to be true is called unit propagation. Um, and that's something that I'm gonna cover um, in a few slides. Okay, so how do you use SAT solvers on package managers? Um, this is kind of what Lipsoft does. Um, you first need to translate your package dependencies into what is called a disjunctive Boolean clauses, so only using ORs. Um, and here I have a few examples. So you have a dependency like A depends on B and C, you will say not A or B and not A or C. Um, because if you think about this, um, if A equals true, it means that it's installed, um, then B needs to be true and C needs to be true. And that's basically uh, uh, reflecting uh, the depends uh, relationship. Uh, the conflicts uh, relationship is uh, um, expressed with two knots because if uh, A equals true, um, then not A equals false. So then um, uh, basically both cannot be uh, true at the same time. Um, in the last one, I'm saying uh, if A depends on B and there are uh, two versions, then uh, you will ex uh, use uh, two expressions. The one saying, well, A depends on both B1 and B2. And then you have an and and another clause when you're saying that B1 and B2 cannot be on the system at the same time. Um, you then translate what you want to do uh, um, in Boolean clauses. So install A is just A remove B will be not B, uh, you solve, and then you're gonna get uh, either a, a solution saying this is solvable or, or non-solvable, uh, and then you get a list of transactions that you need to uh, apply to um, get the system to the correct state. Um, so Lipsolve is a, a specific type of SAT solvers because there are different types is what it's called a conflict-driven clause learning SAT solver. It's a mouthful. <laughs> um, and this is how it works. And don't worry if um, you don't get all of this. I'm gonna, work, uh, I'm gonna walk you through a, uh, an example uh, after this slide. So basically you start saying, uh, you start doing a unit propagation first to make sure that uh, you're in a good state. Uh, then you initialize something called the decision level to zero. Uh, then as long as there are unassigned variables, uh, you do an assignment. And this is where the package manager heuristics uh, come into play. So you, for example, favor to leave packages uh, installed or try to favor uh, the highest versions of available packages. Uh, after you assign a variable, you increment the decision level, you do, you do unit propagation, um, and you keep track of uh, everything that you're doing uh, uh, on an implication graph. If uh, there is a conflict, uh, you go to your graph, try to find out uh, when the conflict happened. You then add a clause that is the negation of, of, of the assignment that led to the conflict. And you backtrack uh, to the decision level before the conflict happened. And so if you think about it, a, a, a conflict-driven close learning SAT solver is, is a backtracking algorithm. That, that's what it is. 
Okay, so this is an example. So in this example, I have a package A that depends on X. And X is provided by two packages. So it can either be provided by B, uh, which has a, has a conflict with D, or by C. Um, so um, if D is installed, uh, what you would expect is that uh, X will be provided by C, the one that doesn't have a, a conflict. So you will end up installing uh, A and C. Um, and in solver notation, this is how it looks like. Um, the first clause is saying A depends uh, on B or C. Uh, then you're saying uh, B has a conflict with D and uh, I want to install A. And uh, let's work through, through that expression. Okay. So you first uh, set A equals true because A is what you want to install. Then you do unit propagation. So if you set A equals true, um, you're going, going to end up with the first clause being not A, false, um, then or B or C, and the rest is the same. And then the last clause is going to be uh, true. You then select a, a variable to set. And that's when uh, you use package manager uh, uh, heuristics. So we choose D because D is already installed. So you set D equals true. Then you replace D on the expression. And um, the first one uh, is going to uh, stay the same. Then the second one, you're going to end up with not B or false. The third one is the same. Then you do unit propagation because on the middle expression, the only way that middle expression uh, can be uh, true is if B equals false. With that, you end up with this expression um, where the only way the first expression can be true is if C equals true. Um, and with that, you have a, a solved expression that is satisfiable. And it's satisfiable uh, with the values of A equals true. Um, B equals false, so it stays uninstalled. Uh, C equals true, and D uh, stays uh, uh, installed. So basically, that tra translates to install A and C, which is the correct solution. Um, so yeah, SAS solvers are, are, are great. And there's one more uh, scenario that I want to uh, uh, walk you guys through that I think is uh, uh, shows the power of, of, of SAT solvers. So in this scenario, I have a package A at version one that depends on B. And then I have package B at version one. And I uh, say, let's go ahead and install A. So as you would expect, uh, you will install A and B version uh, 1.0. But now let's say that you uh, add more packages. So you're going to end up adding a new version of A, 2.0. Uh, and two new versions of B. Uh, B version 2.0 uh, doesn't have conflicts, but um, B version um, 3.0 has a conflict with A. So you can think of it as, uh, as this. You have one version of A, 2.0, and two versions of B, uh, but the higher version uh, has a conflict uh, with A. So this is, this is what happens. Um, with the internal solver of a package, um, A is correctly upgraded to version 2.0, uh, but B stays at 1.0, it's not touched. Um, and this is the same thing that the package does. It will upgrade A and it will leave B uh, um, untouched. Uh, a package uh, with libsolve uh, is smarter than that and it will uh, upgrade B to 2.0. Uh, which is arguably a, a, a better um, end state. Um, so SAT solvers have the power to, to be able to, to figure this out. Uh, uh, ad hoc solvers, uh, they try to just uh, favor higher versions. So they try uh, the highest version of B. And then if that's uh, non-installable, they give up and say, well, OK, then I'm not going to touch B. Um, so with all this, um, 
kind of what I'm saying is that um, use the lips of backend. Uh, uh, if, if you can spare the 500K, uh, it's great. It works really well. And um, um, on the code base, uh, I'm deprioritizing fixing the errors on the, the box on the internal solver uh, because Libsolve just works so well. And with OE, it's the default. So if you have a, a build of OE by default, it's going to be including uh, Libsolve. So future work. Um, I'm terrible at drawings. <laughs> so if um, some of you want to collaborate and are good at logos, uh, that'd be great. <laughs> um, the build system um, right now is based on auto tools and is it could it could use a, 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 a modernization. So uh, I, I'm thinking CMake. Um, right now, I think is 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 overly complicated. Um, error handling in a package, it's is not that bad, but it could it could be better. I think this that that's an area where uh, the code base needs to be um, improved. Um, the sister repo to O package, uh, O package utils, where a lot of the uh, different utilities uh, exist. Um, I think that repo is the one that it probably needs the most work. Uh, it's uh, it could use some cleaning. Um, the ATS, uh, I like it a lot. Uh, with the um, with the language that uh, that I just show you, uh, is very easy to you know. Whenever I get a bug, I first go and try to replicate the bug in the ATS, uh, make that test fail. Then I will implement my um, my fix. I will run and make sure that it works. Uh, so. So it's great, uh, but it's not, it's not exercising a lot of different config options. So that's something that could be uh, uh, improved on. Um, right now, there is no website. That's something that's been on my radar for, for a while. Um, and also, uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, uh, OpenWRT. Um, and I'm going to do that in the next slide. Um, but the last bullet point, uh, that's the link to um, the open box. Um, we have a little bit over 40, so that's another great place to to, to start if, if you want to uh, engage with the community and with the project, which which will be great. So open WRT, um, that's, a, as you probably know, a Linux distribution that uh, runs on routers, is very popular, um, and they run a uh, package. But they basically forked O package on a very old version, and then they're doing cherry picks. Um, back in 2016, there was an effort by Florin uh, Grandi to make a OES O package uh, support all the things that OpenWRT uh, required. So I worked with him. Uh, we put in a, a bunch of packages, but in the end, the effort was not picked up. Um, by the uh, OpenWRT community, and um, I feel like there's duplication of efforts. Every time that uh, there's a split, uh, it, it sounds to me like a, like a missed opportunity. Um, so I'm not sure if you guys saw this, but um, there, this was all over the news. There was a, a security vulnerability on the uh, OPackage OpenWRT fork. Uh, the vulnerability did not affect a uh, OISO package. It was on specific code of OpenWRT and was pretty bad. It basically um, allowed you man the middle attacks that will let you um, bypass a, a, a consistency checks. Uh, so you will be running a arbitrary code on, on, on your router. Um, and the first thing that, that I thought when I saw this is uh, if we were on the same code base, um, maybe this will have happened. Um, so um, if there's someone from the OpenWRT community uh, and is interested in, in, in merging the code bases, uh, please reach out. Uh, I would love to do it. I think some of the uh, specific things that OpenWRT need, uh, 
like being flexible on, on, on what you link to so you get uh, small binaries is something that we can work on. Um, so yeah, uh, if you're interested, please uh, reach out to me. And uh, with that, um, let's go ahead and go over questions. Uh, thanks again for um, uh, listening to my presentation. Um, hope to see you in person at some point in the future. Hello again, thanks for uh, watching my presentation. I'm not gonna go over and um, answer some of the questions that you guys put on the chat window. So the first one says, how does a package keep track uh, of the installed packages? Does it maintain like the package, a database containing all information about the installed packages? Um, yeah, the answer is yes, it keeps it actually uses the same format. So it stores um, a status file, and in that file, you have package metadata and it, um, its state. So it says like if a package is installed or if a package is half installed. Um, and I think it's using a pretty much the same um, format as the package. Um, also, when you do a package update, uh, a package goes and uh, gets all the metadata um, for the different fields that you have configured. And it also stores that metadata in, in files uh, the same way as, as um, a D package or APT. Okay. So the second question says, why not give the option to build a package without the ad hoc solver? How much memory will that save? So effectively, when you configure a package to use leaf solve, you are not compiling the ad hoc solver. So I didn't mention that on the presentation, but, uh, but that's how it works. So if you use a uh, configure dash dash with libsolve, um, you're not compiling the, the, the internal solver, um, which makes it a, a, a real pluggable architecture. So if we wanted to add a new solver, uh, uh, you know, you will not be paying the price for the libsolve or ad hoc solver uh, hookings. This next question says, has you considered Meson for the build system? Hmm. Um, I have not. I'm, I'm pretty open to, use, uh, to using something more modern uh, over what we have. Um, so I'm not super familiar with Meson. I'm more familiar with CMake, but uh, I'm certainly open to uh, collaborate and use uh, something more modern. So, uh, so, so, so thanks for the tip. I'll, I'll definitely look into Meson. The next one says, um, I think OpenWRT changed the package format. Wouldn't that be a problem to merge them? Hmm, okay, I was, I don't have enough information to, to answer this question. I will think that as long as the format didn't change in a very fundamental way, um, I will be optimistic. I, I think, I think there are ways to accommodate even changes on the format as long as the control file uh, stays the same. If it's just like packaging around it, the way um, is being uh, compressed, etc., that's something uh, that I think we can work on. Um, a package has a lot of different uh, build flags as well as a, a runtime flags, with the main idea being. Um, uh, that you just fine tune to, to, to whatever you need. You make the trade-offs that, that make sense for you. So I can totally see uh, having a, a flag for, for different formats being a, a, a thing. Um, so the next question says, have you compared a package to APK as using Alpine Linux? Oh, okay, huh, this is a very good question. Um, so I saw that coming on the, a mailing list is there's there's some interest on APK. Um, I, I I meant to look into APK to to check was uh, how's its uh, dependency management. Um, I haven't done it yet. Um, I know APK is super popular for Alpine Linux. Um, 
So, so I think this it's a good conversation to have. Um, it's happening on the OE mailing list, but we, we should definitely look at the merits um, of APK um, to see if like it makes sense to have a, a another backend. Sorry, not another backend, another uh, package manager added to the family of OE supported package managers. Okay, so uh, William is uh, saying that he thinks that OpenWRT replace R with another tar. Uh, okay, so that would be an easy one. Actually, I think right now O package already has support for the um, R layer to be tar instead of R. So if that's the only thing that changed, uh, it should either already work or it should be uh, fairly simple to to get it to work. Mm. Okay, so that's all I have. And if there are no other questions, we can finish the session. Uh, thank you so much for a uh, being here and if you want to continue this conversation uh, i'm on the slack channel so uh, ping me and we can talk more there